So in this video, I want to talk a little bit about enzyme regulation. And um, it's very, very important to understand enzyme regulation just because we're going to talk about a lot of different enzymes and a lot of different pathways, including glycolysis, the TCA cycle, and, and others. And so we need to understand how enzymes, enzymes are regulated. So there are particular ways to, enzyme, to regulate uh, enzyme activity. And it's also important to kind of keep in mind how should we know if an enzyme is going to be regulated? What kind of which enzymes would be regulated, right? That's what that's what we want to you know, keep in mind and consider and and be able to think about. So one of the ways uh, there are different levels of regulation. For instance, if there's a particular enzyme that you have, you have to remember that enzymes are proteins, right? And proteins come, if you recall the central dogma, they come basically from DNA. DNA is transcribed into mRNA and mRNA is then translated into, pro into proteins so how much of a protein or an enzyme is you know that is made can be regulated based on you know how much of it is actually transcribed how much of that MNA mRNA is processed or how that mRNA is processed uh, how much of that is translated or how is it translated um, and proteolysis is proteolytic level um, sort of describes uh, the proteolysis is simply the the you know breaking up of a protein so all of these these are all at all these different levels we can have regulation of how much enzyme is even created okay I'm not gonna talk too much about this which is kind of why I just breezed over it just now um, but I do want to talk about this here so there are you know plenty of ways to actually regulate protein activity but the three that I'm primarily concerned with and that I want to mention in this video uh, are these three. The first one is allosteric control, which is something we've actually hinted on um, in a previous video about hemoglobin. We mentioned co cooperativity, uh, which was a form of allosteric regulation or allosteric control. But there will be a, a video um, specifically on allosteric regulation later. Um, I also want to talk about reversible covalent modification. Um, it'll also have its own video that includes um, uh, phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. Again, I'll, I'll include that in a later video. Uh, and of, of course, this last bit here, the irreversible covalent modification, which includes proteolytic activation. Um, again, that means the cutting up of a protein once it's actually been translated. So uh, that will also have its own video. Um, so now, uh, so all this, all, more on all this later. But let's talk about how you should know. How would we know if an enzyme is regulated? Or which enzymes would we expect to be regulated or regulated highly? Let's think about this. Enzymes that catalyze reactions that are pretty much irreversible. So if, an, if a reaction is pretty much irreversible, then it's going to have a delta G that's large and negative, which sort of means that it is a spontaneous or a very spontaneous um, reaction, right? So if something's going to be very, very spontaneous, the reverse reaction would be very non-spontaneous, would require a large input of energy. So if an enzyme is irreversible, right, then we want to make sure that if that reaction actually goes, right, that we want to create that particular product. Because if it's irreversible, we can't undo it, right? So basically the, the reasoning behind this first thing here, the idea that we would expect enzymes that catalyze reactions that are irreversible to be highly regulated because we want to make sure that if there's a particular irreversible step right that creates a particular product we want to make sure that that irreversible step only happens when it needs to happen or when it should happen because if we can't reverse it that's a bad thing right so we want to make sure that the enzyme that catalyzes a reaction that ir is irreversible is highly regulated so that the reaction doesn't occur needlessly the second thing is enzymes that that catalyze reactions or, or catalyze the first committed step in a metabolic pathway. What what is this idea behind the first committed step? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you think about it, the the first committed step is the first step that commits to a particular pathway. Now um, I've drawn out this this sort of idea here to kind of represent what I'm talking about or what I want to talk about here. So if we think about each of these, you know, A, B, C, D, all these different little things here um, as being uh, substrates and products of particular reactions, um, for instance, A to B is catalyzed by enzyme 1, B to C, enzyme 2, and, and so on and so forth. Notice that once we get to D here, D can either go through this path to create E, F, and G, which is 
this pathway's end product, this thing here is an end product, or D can go down this pathway, X, Y, and Z, and create Z, which is also an end product. Now these are two different pathways. So in essence, D can go to either E or D can go to X. So both of these steps, right, D going to E, once D has gone to E, it has committed to this pathway, which has the G as the end product. If it goes via the uh, goes to X via the uh, enzyme or the uh, via the step catalyzed by enzyme seven, then it's going to commit to creating Z as an end product. So essentially, we want to make sure that that the steps that catalyze the committed steps, right, the enzymes that catalyze the committed steps are highly regulated. Okay, so that's kind of where this where this gets at. We don't want to commit to a particular pathway unless we want to create that particular end product. Another thing I want to mention is that um, as far as how that is sort of regulated, we would expect enzyme 4 and enzyme 7 to be highly regulated because they both catalyze um, first committed steps, right? So we would expect enzyme 7 and enzyme 4 to be regulated, right? Oftentimes, the end product of a particular pathway inhibits the enzyme that catalyzes the first committed step. So in this case, G is the end product of this particular pathway, this top pathway here, which enzyme number four catalyzes that step, that first committed step. Here, Z is the end product of this pathway. It would inhibit enzyme seven. So I put this little negative sign here to sort of indicate that that this these end products would inhibit the first step that commits to that pathway. It makes sense, right? Because if if you don't want to create, if you have a lot of G, for instance, if, they, if they, uh, you have a bunch of G's hanging around, um, these these G's, you don't want to keep creating more of them. So the best way to stop the production of them is to stop the step that commits to creating G, right? And the same thing here with Z. If there's a bunch of Z around, we want to stop making it. Well, the best way to do that is to stop the the pathway from even beginning to occur. Right, so you would inhibit these enzymes here, which catalyze the first committed step in those particular pathways. The last thing is that if there's an enzyme that catalyzes a slow step in a pathway or the rate determining step in a pathway, then because it determines the rate and at which that reaction goes, we want to regulate that particular enzyme. Okay, so I want you to keep these three ideas in mind, but mostly these two, mostly these two are the most important. Okay. Um, We'll be we'll be mentioning that especially the idea of a first committed step um, later when we talk about glycolysis. Many of you might already know what I'm getting at here. Um, so these are the most important, at least in my opinion. So I hope that was helpful in sort of introducing you to enzymes and uh, how they're regulated. Um, so thanks for watching.